Uh, welcome, this is Simplified Unit Testing with the EF Core In Memory Provider. Hi, I'm Jason. I'm a solution architect with SSW. You can find me on Twitter at JasonGTAU or on my blog at codingflow.net. I've been a developer now for 20 years. I started out using a Commodore 64, recently upgraded to PC. And uh, right now I'm specializing. What was that? Yeah. Right now I'm specializing in uh, single page applications using .NET Core, EF Core, and Angular. Uh, this year I've deployed a number of .NET Core applications to production, and today I want to share with you a simplified approach to unit testing applications that depend on EF Core. So we've, we're going to cover six different sections as part of this talk. I don't want to leave anyone in the dark, so I'm going to start off by introducing EF Core and essentially providing you with some resources so that you can get up to speed if you need to. On the same token, I'm going to do the same for unit testing. If there's anyone here that's not familiar with unit testing, I've got four great resources that I can share with you that will take you all the way through the journey. Then we're going to look at the typical approach to unit testing. are a big barrier for people writing any tests at all. Then we're going to look at the simplified approach. The simplified approach uses the in-memory provider, uh, and I think you'll find that it's much easier and removes that barrier. Then we're going to discuss some limitations and concerns, and I'm going to show you beyond a doubt that there are no limitations or concerns with this approach. And finally, I'm going to share some resources so that I can help you get up and running with this approach. So by the end of this talk, you'll have not only the capability to write simplified unit tests with the EF Core in memory provider, but also to simplify your overall solution architecture. So let's have a look at Entity Framework Core. So Entity Framework Core was built from the ground up to be lightweight, extensible and cross-platform, and most importantly, highly testable. You can run it on .NET Core or the .NET Framework. If you run it on .NET Core, you can of course run it on Windows, Linux, or Mac. If you run it on the .NET Framework, then you get to run it on Windows. Now, if you're uh, building a new project and you're trying to decide, should I use Entity Framework 6 or should I use Entity Framework Core, you can take a look at this resource. This resource will show you that there are in fact some feature gaps between these two frameworks, and that might of course uh, uh, change your decision. Then if you've got an existing application and you want to move away from EF6 to EF Core, you want to take a look at this resource because there is no upgrade path from EF6 to EF Core. It's a completely different project and uh, you'll actually have to port your application. So again, you'll be looking at some of the things that might be missing from EF Core uh, that may never be implemented in EF Core and you need to decide whether that's the right approach for you. as well as the new upcoming features. Next, unit testing. So for those of you that are new to unit testing, I've got four great resources. The first is unit testing in .NET Core, so that's the latest Microsoft documentation. Then we have the bowling game Carter. Now this is something that I tried out very early on. It's from Uncle Bob. He's the author of Clean Code. And if you do this every day for two weeks, it's going to give you uh, a really good feel of what it's like to do test-driven development. So this is a test-first Carter, and uh, you'll basically create a very simple game. Then we've got test-driven development by example. This is by Kent Beck. So he's the father of TDD, and this has two parts to it. The first part will guide you by example how to create an application from scratch using TDD. And then the second part will be the uh, patterns and practices for TDD. We have The Art of Unit Testing by Roy Oshrov. And this is a particularly good book because it has examples in .NET Core. So some of these other books, they're not going to cover mocking and test doubles. Um, sorry, this doesn't have examples in .NET Core. It has examples in .NET, um, but they're highly applicable to what you'd be doing in .NET Core. So the examples are in .NET. All right, so let's have a look at the typical approach to unit testing an application that depends on Entity Framework Core. So the first thing that you need to do is remove all of those dependencies on Entity Framework Core. 
because you simply can't test it. If it's calling out to an external database, that's not a unit test. You need to uh, remove those dependencies. Next, you need to implement some abstraction. So obviously you've removed those dependencies. You need uh, to bring your data layer back in somehow. And a typical approach to that is the repository and unit of work pattern. So you create yourself a new unit of work, you create yourself a new repository, or you leverage an existing framework, uh, and you access your entity framework and, your, and therefore your database through those abstractions. Then you need to create test doubles. So before you can actually uh, do any unit testing or as part of your unit testing, you create a test double for your unit of work and you create a test double for every single repository that you have. So these test doubles mock the behavior of the, the real objects so that you can say test an ASP.NET Core MVC controller. And once you've done all that, you can write some unit tests. So he, he, who here is familiar with that approach? And who here likes that approach? No one. What, no, one guy. One guy likes that approach, and that's okay. So what I'm going to show you here today is that EF Core in-memory provider can be used without a lot of those things, but it can also be used with those things. So let's have a look at the simplified approach. So the simplified approach is in complete contrast to this typical approach. We're not going to remove any dependencies on Entity Framework. In fact, we're going to use Entity Framework directly in our controllers or in our queries or in our commands, depending on what architecture we're following. So the DB context, the class that's responsible for all interactions with the database, we'll use that directly. We're not going to need to implement any abstractions because we're using the DB context. We have nothing to abstract. And we therefore won't need to create test doubles because we're not implementing those abstractions. So there might be other services that we might create test doubles for, but it's certainly not going to be with our Entity Framework core. So that only leaves us one thing to do, and that's writing unit tests. So let's take a look at how that's possible now. I have two demos that I would like to show you today. And uh, the first one is just a getting started. Now, we don't have internet access here, um, but normally the first thing that we would need to do is to install in memory. Um, so that would be done through NuGet Package Manager or through the Package Manager console. And you'd be installing the Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCore.InMemory NuGet package. So you can see here, might be a little bit small. You can see here that it's already installed. So we're basically good to go. So let's have a look at the structure of this application. This is a really simple application. It's a console application that queries out to a database to retrieve a list of customers. And uh, the way that it does that is it uses a get customer query class. And you can see that this class has a Northwind context, which is an entity framework core context. It passes that in, that gets injected in, and then it returns a list of customers. So you can see we have two things that we can test here. We can test that this method returns the correct type, so iListCustomer, and also that it returns all items from the database. So is it it's not doing any filtering. We're not expecting this method to do any filtering. So let's have a look at writing those two tests now. And of course, this will be using the simplified approach. OK. So the first thing we will test is that execute should return correct type. Now, the, the system under test is the query. So we'll go ahead and new up a query. Now that's not quite going to work because we also need a DB context. So we'll go ahead and new up a DB context. Uh, a Northwind context. And that has two constructors, one that's empty and one that accepts a DB context options. Now we'll whack this in here. So our query is good to go. But let's have a look at that constructor. So 
I'll just close this test window. So you can see that the default constructor doesn't have any arguments, but what ends up happening is because the options builder hasn't been configured, it will connect to a local SQL Server database. Now that's not going to work for our testing purposes, so we're going to need to uh, construct a DB context options and pass that in. So how do we do that? Like this. We construct a new DB context options builder and we tell it it is of type Northwind context and then we say we're going to use the in-memory database and then we say we want the options so there's our options so we can go ahead and pass that in to our context and now we've satisfied all the dependencies so we can go ahead and write our test so we'll go and follow the pattern. So first we arrange, and then we act. So we want to grab the result, which is going to be query.execute. That's simple. And then we need to do an assertion. So we assert. So we say assert dot is assignable from type, and the type is I list customer. And we pass in the result like that. So that's our complete test. So we'll go ahead and run that, and fingers crossed it will pass. And it does. So we'll write our second test, which is to make sure that this uh, query method returns all items from the database. But I want to highlight something um, as we do this. So I'm just going to change this first test just a tiny bit. I just want to seed this context. And I'm going to do that in the next test. And you can see here that I'm using, let me make this a bit bigger again. You can see here that I'm using a helper method to do that. So it's just seeding in six customers and uh, saving those changes to the context. And that's, that's the data that we're going to use for testing. So now we say our next test will return all customers. And we can do a new assertion. So we assert dot true, um, sorry, assert.equal, and that's going to be six customers, and result.count. Okay, now if I build that, I've got the test set to run after build, um, and they passed. That's because I forgot to do one thing. I wanted to seed this Okay, so that's what I expected to see. So you can see I've got two unit tests. They're both basically doing exactly the same thing. One tests that it's returning the correct type, which is iList customer, and the other one's checking that it's returning the correct number of items. And what we're seeing here is that these tests are not isolated. They're actually sharing the same instance of the in-memory database. Uh, so we need to have our tests isolated. We don't want um, one test to impact the result of another test. So if I ran these two tests um, separately now, they'll both pass. It's just when they run together uh, that they fail. So when you look at the Microsoft documentation, this is what they show you, is that you can go ahead and actually just give a name to each in-memory database. So we'll go ahead and do that now. And the pattern that's being currently recommended is to use the test name. So if we run that, we're expecting that these tests will now run in isolation and they will both pass. And that's, that's kind of great, but it's also really messy. Like we have two very simple tests here and we've got all of this setup logic and I don't like it at all. Does anyone here think that it's a little bit messy to do it that way? Yeah, and um, 
it's kind of like, well, we, we got rid of our um, mocking and uh, all of the setup code that goes with that, but now we've just replaced it with the setup code, which is, which is here, and, and I didn't like that at all. So uh, I, I went and I found another approach to doing that, and um, you can see here, I've got another uh, application, and this is a uh, ASP, oh, one sec. So this is a ASP.NET Core web API, and it's a, a customer's controller. And you can see we have a direct dependency on Entity Framework through the Northwind context. And it's very simple. It's what you'd expect from, from an API. Uh, so we have get customers, get an individual customer by ID. Uh, we have a post customer, so we can add a new customer. We have put customer, so we can update an existing customer and delete customer. Now. I've written tests for all of those methods, so we'll load that up. So you can see here we've got really nice tests. Uh, so we've got a uh, get customers returns correct type, and you can see that it's it's really simple. We have the controller, which is the system under tests. We have the the action, which is get customers, and we have the assertion that it's returning the correct type. And th and these tests are all like that. They're really clean. Every single one. And this is where we want to get to. But if I run this, if I do a quick build and let those tests run using that pattern only one passes. They'll all, they'll all pass individually, um, but, but with the way that it's currently set up, only one will pass. So we've got to make some changes here. So the first thing I want to show you is that using XUnit, your test setup code is happening in the constructor, and that runs before each test. And then again with XUnit, uh, the set deinitialize code is actually happening in the dispose method. So that runs after each test. So uh, there's, there's 12 tests here. So the constructor will run 12 times and the dispose will run 12 times. Now, what we have to do here is change the constructor so that we can have isolated tests. Now, obviously, we can't just go in uh, use a name. Well, we could, but um, we'd have to use a unique name for each test. Uh, one way to do that is to go good dot you good dot to string, and that'll work. Uh, and and look, um, it's simple. It's not a bad approach actually. In Entity Framework Core two preview two, database name is now required. So what you're seeing without database name today, that's going to change in the future. Uh, so it'll be a required field. So so that's okay. Uh, but there are a couple of other approaches that you can use. Um, my preferred approach, and I've found this works best when you're running tests in parallel, when you just have no idea, uh, is to use a, a, a service provider. So use your own dependency injection to pass in the in-memory provider to the options builder. So it's, it sounds complicated, but it's really simple to set up. So if we just go and new up a new service collection, and then through extensions, we add the in-memory database, then all we have to do is say, build service provider, and we can pass that right in. So we say, use internal service provider. And that's all we need to do. Uh, not quite, we need to fix that. But uh, that, that, that will work. Those tests will now, now run uh, without, without having to specify a name, or you can specify the same name, um, because it's, it's inserting a unique instance of that in-memory database for each test. And those tests just ran in parallel. So that was 12 tests, all hopefully running at once, although this is only dual core, so not, not exactly. Um, and that, that ran without problem. There's a couple of other things that you can do which, which are worthwhile. Uh, so after you new up your context in the constructor, you might want to just go context.database.insurecreated. And it's not, it's, it's not necessary, um, but this next, part, this next part is. And they, they kind of work nicely in a pair. So come down to 
the dispose method. And then before you dispose of your context, we go context.database.insure-deleted. So obviously, uh, if you've got a large volume of tests, that's going to be pretty important. So I'm running 12 tests here today, but if I just leave those databases in memory, they'll shut down after the tests have finished running, um, but in the meantime, they're consuming memory. So we could run that. Everything should still be passing. We've just added the insure created and insure deleted. Uh, and that's, that's probably my preferred approach to using in memory. Now, we'll just make this big again. You can see here that the tests are all isolated now and uh, they're simple. And also, if I, if I wanted to, I could actually abstract the the data side of those things into a completely separate class and reuse it for all my tests. So right now we're just looking at the customer's controller. It needs a DB context. We give it a DB context. Later on we're going to be looking at the orders controller and we could just have an abstract class which we could utilize for the, for the same benefit. Uh, so that's, that's pretty much the simplified approach. It's just utilizing the in-memory provider without the need to abstract yourself from uh, Entity Framework. And uh, before we move on, is there any questions? No problem. Well, th well that's good. I mean, it is a simple approach. Um, so hopefully, hopefully there are no questions. So let's talk a little bit about the EF Core in-memory provider. What is it exactly? Well, it's just a database provider like the SQL Server provider or the Oracle provider. It uses an in-memory database uh, and it's been built specifically for testing purposes. So uh, if you're thinking I'm going to create an application that uses in-memory for production and it's going to be ultra fast, don't do that because as soon as your application shuts down, all the data is going to disappear just for testing purposes. It's part of the official EF Core framework. Uh, it has no overhead of I.O. operations because it's not calling any external resources and it's lightweight with minimal dependencies. Uh, so the dependencies are really just the Entity Framework Core and the particular version of .NET Standard. So there are some limitations to keep in mind. The first is that it's not a relational database provider, so it's not going to behave in the same way that you might expect if you were calling directly against SQL Server. So for example, constraints won't be enforced. Uh, you could violate referential integrity. Uh, for unit testing purposes, this doesn't matter. You're not testing Entity Framework. You're not testing SQL Server or Oracle or Postgres. You're testing whatever your system under test is. You, you might be testing your controller or your query or your command. So what's important is that the in-memory provider behaves like a database, and it does a very good job at that. So there's no limitations there. When I raise this approach, often people raise concerns. And the first one is that you're writing integration tests and not unit tests. And this would only be true if I was writing integration tests to test the in-memory provider. Uh, but there'd be no point in doing that. That's not going to production. I can't test entity, I can't test SQL Server using the in-memory provider because it doesn't call any external resources. So you've seen here today the test that I've written, they're testing the query and they're testing the controller. So it's really about your focus, what your system under test is and understanding the aspects of that that you need to test. So when I tested my query, I looked at the type that was being returned and the fact that the query wasn't doing any filtering. I wasn't testing any particular aspects of Entity Framework or the database. The next one is lack of isolation. So the tests are exercising code with dependencies on Entity Framework, and that's completely true. But my tests are also exercising code with dependencies on .NET Core, and I'm okay with that. I trust .NET Core, and I trust Entity Framework Core. And next, we have unit of work and repository patterns are best practice. And that's true, they are. They're a great practice, and Entity Framework does a great job at implementing them. The uh, unit of work is implemented in the DB context, that is a unit of work, and the repository is implemented in the DB set, that is a repository. So Entity Framework is already implementing both of those patterns. So if you implement those patterns on top of Entity Framework, you're abstracting an abstraction. 
And so the value in that is you're abstracting yourself from entity framework. And that's an important point to make. You're not abstracting yourself from the database layer. Entity framework has already done that for you. So if we have a look at that in the uh, application that I wrote here, we can see in our application config, one of the nice things about .NET Core is I can just open my config without actually closing down the project. This is my reference to SQL Server. Now if I want to change that to Oracle, this is where I can change it. So I'm completely abstracted from the database. So re remember, if you do implement repository and unit of work, it's not to abstract yourself from the database, it's to abstract yourself from entity framework. So you're worried that having a dependency on entity framework will limit you in the future, and you want to keep that abstraction so that you can move perhaps to some other framework or to some other data access technology altogether. So, and finally, I don't like it. I don't know why, but I don't. So, so this was a good one. Um, I, I said to the person, okay, well, that, that's okay, that's okay. Um, why don't you like it? Do you disagree with the things that I've said? And he said, no, everything you've said makes sense. Um, but I just don't like it. And I'm like, okay, no worries. Some people resist change, and that's okay. I said, look, spend some time, look at it, and come back to me. So we'll, we'll see how he goes. So finally, I have some resources to share with you. So the first one is the Microsoft documentation. So this is testing within memory. Now keep in mind that the approach they're currently recommending is to use the database name. And that can work, but I found uh, that using the service provider uh, actually provides um, a more consistent performance for uh, parallel tests. Next one we have is Northwind Traders. So I've rebuilt Northwind Traders uh, using .NET Core and Entity Framework Core because what I wanted was a version of Northwind that was cross-platform. So you could now use Northwind on Windows, Mac, or Linux, uh, SQL Server, in memory. Uh, it's even been tried on uh, Postgres. Um, so that's open source. And one of the interesting things that I, I did with that recently was to uh, begin to upgrade the front end uh, to use clean architecture. Who, who here has heard of clean architecture? Okay, quite a few. Yeah, I, I only just found out about it. So uh, clean architecture is a domain-centric architecture. So if you want to see an example of that, you can have a look at Northwind Traders. Um, and, and, and as a side note, uh, Microsoft is releasing a book uh, on clean architecture. You can see the architecture guidance for that. And Uncle Bob is also releasing a book on clean architecture. So now we'll have clean code, clean coders, and clean architecture. So I'll definitely be looking into that more in the future. Uh, but if you just need a database to get up and running with EF Core and something to write tests against, you can use that. Okay, and next we have the .NET Core Dev Superpowers Tour uh, by SSW. Uh, that's coming up in a couple of weeks. You can see in Sydney, it'll be on the 27th of July. Uh, we're gonna show you everything that you need to know to get up and running with .NET Core. Uh, so building console applications, building MVC, Web API, single page applications, uh, entity framework, and uh, deployment. So come along to that. Uh, it'll be presented by myself and uh, Brendan Richards, who is another S SSW solution architect. And finally, in summary, so the simplified approach that I've shown you today, you don't need to remove your dependencies on Entity Framework. You don't need to implement abstractions. You use the, dependent, you use the DB context directly uh, for your controllers, commands, your queries, wherever you're using it. And uh, you use the DB context directly in your tests. The only thing that's different is the provider. You don't need to create test doubles. You use the DB context directly. So that just leaves you with one thing to do, which is just write unit tests. Thank you. <laughs>